So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janet Gillo, Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, welcoming you to Open Classroom. Uh, today, we have a wonderful talk on food and chemical safety, why and how, now more than ever, um, with Dr. Angela Hobson. Angela serves as a Senior Lecturer and Assistant Dean at the, in the Public Health Program at the Brown School. Her background is in environmental and occupational health, and she started her career in local public health practice as an environmental health specialist before moving into academic research in environmental and occupational metal exposures. Now, along with the administration of our MPH program, Angela teaches courses in epidemiology, environmental health, and leadership at the Brown School. So topics very timely as we are hearing and having concerns about food and chemical safety now more than ever in light of the pandemic. Uh, Angela, welcome. Thank you so much for this talk and, and for participating in Open Classroom. Yeah, thank you, Janet, and thank you to everyone who has joined today. And, you know, I, I kind of um, gave a little bit of thought to my title about um, why and how more now than ever. And I was wondering, is that hyperbole? Am I kind of exaggerating here? And then I thought, no, I'm not. We're, we're living through a pandemic. And um, we really need to think very thoughtfully about um, our food safety and, and our chemical exposures right now. So I think that that's right. Why this is important now more than ever is, is an appropriate title. Um, and like Janet said, I um, started in local public health practice as a registered environmental health specialist. And while this was many moons ago, I did a lot of food safety inspections and um, food safety education to uh, local community members. Um, and while I'm not doing that any longer, I'm still teaching about it and still keeping um, up to date as much as I can in this field. And for those of you who might be um, unfamiliar with what environmental health is, um, just briefly, environmental health really is concerned about what we are exposed to in our physical environment that can cause harm to human health. So we like to say that our physical environment really encompasses a lot of things. We like to claim it all in environmental health, um, but food and chemicals exposures are, are absolutely part of environmental health. And, and there are some legitimate concerns with um, COVID-19 and food safety and chemical and disinfectant safety. So I thought it'd be a good um, time to combine those two topics together. So an outline of what I'll cover today is first I'll start with food safety, just kind of give a general overview of what food safety is and some background information on what foodborne illnesses are. Um, there have been some legitimate concerns that have been raised about food safety in the time of COVID-19, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll also talk about some tips for food safety and preventing foodborne illnesses in our homes that are relevant not only during a pandemic, but at all times. And these are things that we should be thinking about and practicing at all times to prevent foodborne illness. And then I'll move into chemical and disinfectant safety. I'll talk about concerns with misuse as we are all eager to disinfect our homes more than we probably ever were before. So we'll talk about um, some chemical safety. We'll talk about the increases in calls to our poison control centers and what's driving that. And then talk about tips for proper use. So when we talk about food safety, it's really kind of an umbrella term that we use for all the activities that we do to protect our food from contaminants, whether they be biological or chemical or physical contaminants that can cause um, physical injury or illness. So it's a broad term. And um, this picture here is a picture of the food production chain. There are a lot of players in food safety, all the way from production and harvest to the processing of food, distribution, retailers and restaurants. And then of course, consumers have a big role to play in um, food safety as well. We really like to think about this as uh, food safety as being a, a farm to fork continuum. So there are many challenges to keep our food safe. Um, and we all have a lot of responsibility in that. And I'll kind of talk about those different responsibilities as I, as I go through this. Okay, so I always like to, um, I like to keep up with some food safety things in the news and, and multi-state outbreaks. And I always show my students some uh, recent um, headlines to just kind of prompt them to think about 
um, what food safety is. Um, this top one, I don't like to get rid of it, even though it's three years old now, um, just because <laughs> yeah, I see Janet's face and, and you might think, ooh, gross, because ooh, gross. Um, decomposing bat found in Walmart salad. So this was a prepackaged um, uh, salad mix. This was not Walmart's, um, you know, they didn't do this at Walmart. It was in a packaging facility and a bat got into the mix and was decomposing. Um, so, you know, an example there of both a physical and a biological hazard. Um, other things that we see in the news all the time when we have millions of pounds of meat or chicken recalled because of, of concerns of contamination of different pathogens. Um, we see things in the news a lot about multi-state outbreaks. And then most recently, kind of hot off the press, um, we've had concerns about food safety during, during this um, current pandemic. So can we get um, uh, COVID-19 from an infected cook? Um, the answer is probably not. I'll get to that in a little bit. And then um, something that was just in the news a couple of days ago, and I think um, there is some legitimacy to our food safety net being compromised during the time of, of coronavirus um, with uh, decreased inspections um, and citations and recalls during this time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So getting back to why we're so concerned about food safety is because we know food that is not safe can cause foodborne illness. And a lot of what I'm talking about today will focus more on um, pathogenic um, causes of foodborne illness, so um, bacteria and viruses. Um, so foodborne illness is oftentimes um, also called food poisoning, foodborne disease, or foodborne infection. And we can really think of all of these just as a sickness um, that people experience after consuming food or beverages that have been contaminated by microorganisms, chemicals, or physical agents. And the most common symptoms of foodborne illness are vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, and fever. And I'm sure if I took a quick poll of everybody on today's call, um, you could probably all identify times in your life whenever you've experienced these symptoms. Um, but you may be less able to identify whether or not it was a foodborne illness. Um, so this is, these are common symptoms of gastrointestinal illness, and that's part of the problem we have with detecting foodborne illness is that there's a lot of misconceptions about what foodborne illness is, um, and we often don't seek care for foodborne illnesses as, as either. Um, and this is also another reason why we really want to be concerned with food safety right now during a global pandemic. Um, you know, now is probably not the time that you want to seek health care. Um, most people are concerned about staying home and not um, visiting uh, uh, clinical care if they don't need to. Um, being isolated at home and, and having these symptoms. Also, if you are at home and you are isolated with a lot of other family members, you sure don't want to be sick with these symptoms as well and potentially um, have secondary infections. So something that we definitely want to think about when we're thinking about um, some challenges with identifying foodborne illnesses and how to, to stay safe. And then a foodborne illness outbreak is just when um, two or more people become ill um, as a result of eating the same contaminated food or beverages. So earlier I talked about key players in that food continuum, the farm to fork continuum. And I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the structure, the regulatory structure and guideline structure, um, both internationally and um, domestically here in the United States. So this kind of sets the stage for some of the things that I'll talk about later with um, some of the food safety concerns. So on an international level, the United Nations, um, the Food and Agricultural Organization, um, is really the largest international body that works on um, nutrition, um, uh, increased agricultural production, and food safety. It has 180 member um, countries as part of the United Nations, and they really set policies and, and guidelines. Um, they're not really a regulatory agency, but they do a lot of work in terms of um, uh, support and, and policy development. Then here in the United States, our regulatory infrastructure um, is a little bit um, scattered, as a lot of things in, in public health can be. Um, but we have the United States Department of Agriculture, and they have the Food Safety and Inspection Service. And the Food Safety Inspection Service is really responsible for um, inspecting and ensuring um, safety of our meat and poultry processing plants. Um, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration 
is really um, responsible for most of the food safety regulations um, uh, for all of our imported and exported food, except for meat and poultry and alcohol and um, pesticide residue on food. Um, and then in the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, doesn't necessarily have regulatory authority, but they are our main um, national organization that's responsible for surveillance of foodborne illness outbreaks, for doing um, investigations with food, but for foodborne illness outbreaks, and doing a lot of education around food safety. And the, the CDC works really closely with the USDA and the FDA, and also with state and local health departments on um, these activities. And then our state and local health departments are the ones that are really doing the work at the more regional and local levels, um, policy development and policy assurance on food safety standards and enforcing those policies and standards by doing inspections of retail food establishments and also doing um, food safety education. Okay, so I also wanna talk just a, a briefly about food security and the link between food safety and food security. And if you were with us last week on Thursday, Dr. Laura Iannotti did a really great presentation on food and nutrition security. And if you were not able to make that, um, that is available on the YouTube channel and Janet can give us more information about that. But briefly, you know, we talk about food safety as this big umbrella term, um, but food security more specifically, uh, a definition for, of that is when people have um, at all times physical, social, and ac economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences. Um, this graphic here kind of gives us a um, representation of the global disparities in food security. Um, I, in, the, um, in 2018, the World Health Organization um, estimated that about 26% of the world population experienced uh, moderate to severe food insecurity at some point in the year. And then also the USDA um, estimated in 2018 that about 11% of US households experienced um, some type of food insecurity during the year as well. And of course, um, as Laura pointed out in her talk last week, these kinds of graphics may tell us a little bit about variation of food insecurity across the world, but it doesn't tell us anything about the variation within, um, within countries or within cities even. So we know that, um, that oftentimes low income communities and communities of color are the ones who are disproportionately impacted by um, food deserts or lack of food security. And that becomes important too when we talk about food safety and I'll get to that in just a minute. But I want everyone to kind of think about that inextricable link between food safety and food security. Um, food security, it's right there in the definition that it, it should be safe food. You cannot have food or nutrition security if your food is not safe or free from pathogens or free from things that'll, that'll cause injury and illness. And you can kind of take a look at this, um, this graphic and kind of look at the different um, factors that play both into food safety and food security. Um, a little bit of the descriptive epidemiology. So um, for those of you who um, have taken um, epi in the past or you know a little bit about epi, we're just talking about the who, why, and um, when of, of foodborne illness. So in the United States, the CDC estimates that we have about 48 million cases of foodborne illness annually um, and about 128,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths. Then globally, the World Health Organization organization estimates about 600 million cases per year, 420,000 deaths, and this equates to about 33 million healthy life years lost due to foodborne illness. And when we think about this and look at this globally, we know that children under five um, bear about 40 percent of the foodborne disease burden. So this is why we, um, sorry I've got a lot of dinging going on over here, I'm going to try to mute that. Um, so this is why, you know, when I think about food safety, I think of it also being kind of a moral imperative that we keep our food supplies safe because of the impact that it has on very young children. 
And then we also might wonder who else besides young children are vulnerable. Well, with like many um, health issues and health outcomes, we know that pregnant people, um, older adults, and those with compromised immune systems are also more susceptible to, um, to foodborne illnesses and their impact. And then um, because we are the Brown School and we focus a lot on this and we ask a lot of questions and think about um, other disparities besides those broad categories, I wanted to talk just briefly about um, racial and ethnic and income disparities. Um, one issue is that um, we do have limitations in our surveillance system. So the CDC's surveillance system, um, their largest surveillance system on, on foodborne illnesses, was not initially set up to have um, a representative sample of minority populations or low income populations um, in the United States. And even with revisions, um, there's still Hispanic populations are, are very underrepresented in the catchment area for the surveillance system and low income populations are also underrepresented. So we have challenges with our surveillance system, but even so there's a growing um, body of research that shows that uh, uh, communities of color, especially African Americans and um, those of Hispanic ethnicity are at higher risks of certain pathogens, um, Yersinia, Listeria, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and some of these foods can be, or some of these pathogens can be linked to more culturally um, specific foods, um, but others can't. So when it, or they can't be tied to a specific food, we have to ask where in the farm to fork continuum are certain populations more at risk. And um, I wish I could go into more detail on this. I think this is a, a whole other talk. Um, and if you're curious about this, I have my contact information at the end and we can have conversations about this and the, the research that needs to happen in this area. Okay, now if we take, um, if we take our, our microscope or our telescope and zoom back out and look at some trends in foodborne illness in the United States, um, again, this is another hot off the press item. This was published just 13 days ago, um, looking at um, rates of different foodborne illnesses and the comparing the incidents in 2019 to um, 2016 to 2018. And there's a lot going on in this in this table. Um, but what I wanted to really say here and to get across, if you look at the incidents in 2019 and then you compare it to the incidents from um, three years prior, you can see that there is um, increases or very little change. And the article that this is tied to also talks about, you know, we're kind of at a, a, a we've stalled. We've stalled with food safety and foodborne illnesses. We're not really seeing decreases in many foodborne illnesses and maybe even some increases in others. And there are several reasons. And one of those could be that, you know, it may not be that we are actually having more cases, but we do have improved diagnostic tests. So we have diagnostic tests that don't require a culturation of the, of the living organism. So we have a lot more rapid testing that identifies um, foodborne illnesses. So that could be part of the problem, or not part of the problem, but part of the issue. Um, and uh, just thinking about um, uh, trends in foodborne illnesses, and we're not really seeing decreases despite interventions that we've, we've um, put in place for food safety. Okay, quickly, I wanted to go through um, this table. These are the top five food known foodborne illnesses in the United States in 2011. So this data is a little bit old, but trends um, kind of tell us that this is, um, this is the top five that we typically see. Um, and I won't go through this um, cell by cell, but part of the reason I wanted to put this on here is for people to think about the different types of foods that these pathogens are associated with that there's an, a, a, a variation in infective dose. So we always need to think about that too. And then um, the, the symptoms start or the incubation period. So that's another myth that we have with foodborne illness. Many people think that when they get sick, it's the last thing that they ate. And when you look at this, you can see there's quite a bit of variation, anywhere from two hours to 72 hours for some of these. Um, so we know, we know that it's not always the last thing that you ate, and this can also be a challenge in identifying foodborne illness because we are also thinking about recall and people remembering the types of food they ate for you know, three days ago. And right now I'm thinking, I don't, I'm not really sure I remember what I ate for breakfast, let alone if I could remember what I ate two, um, two or three days ago. So another challenge in identifying foodborne illness. 
We also know that foodborne illnesses are heavily underreported. And when we think about why, I think I've alluded to a lot of that already. Um, but I like this graphic from the Nevada Department of, of Public Health. And you think of these and um, you can think of the symptoms that are associated with each of these um, people. And I think the, the main thing is, is when you're feeling like this, right, when you're vomiting, when you have diarrhea, when you have a fever, you don't necessarily feel like going to your physician to, um, to get checked out, right? You want to stay in bed. You feel like you can't even get out of bed. And then by the time you feel better, you don't feel like you need to go seek care. And that's how we identify foodborne illnesses and what the pathogens, pathogens are, are by taking a specimen sample and figuring out what it was that people were exposed to. Um, and a lot of people don't like to do that either. Um, so that's one, one reason they're heavily underreported. And then, like I said earlier, there's a lot of myths or misunderstandings about what foodborne illness is. And we might just think we have the stomach flu or a stomach bug, right? And so that's, that, might, that might be true, but it might actually be foodborne. And if we don't have um, clinical testing, then we, we can't be certain that that's what it was. Um, I like this pyramid because I think it speaks um, not only to foodborne illness outbreaks, but we can apply this to our current situation with COVID-19 and thinking about challenges in the system and identifying cases and having a strong surveillance system. So if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, we know that there is a certain population certain amount of the population that is exposed, that are exposed to pathogens, disease-causing pathogens. Um, and we know that out of those people who are exposed, some people will become ill. This is the same thing with COVID-19, right? Some people don't become ill, or some people are symptomatic, asymptomatic. Um, of the people who become ill, there's a smaller portion of folks who go and seek clinical care. And then there's a smaller proportion that a specimen is actually obtained. And then we might have a lab test for that. And then we have a laboratory confirmed case. And even though um, a lot of surveillance is active surveillance and the CDC is actively trying to find cases or it might be required by law to report to a health department or CDC, we still know that there's um, under reporting and that we miss cases. Okay, so this kind of brings me to food safety during COVID-19. There have been some, some concerns like I talked about earlier. So some relaxation of federal regulations and standards, um, fewer inspections by, um, by the FDA in particular. People are concerned about um, getting COVID-19 from food and food packaging or from food workers and delivery drivers. And then um, uh, safety at the store and at home. And one of the issues with home is that we're all home much more now and we're all cooking a lot more now. And if you're not used to cooking, you may not be used to taking um, um, proper measures at home. So we'll talk about that as well. So relaxation of standards and inspections. And what I, what I don't wanna do here is I'm not trying to sound alarm bells. I'm not trying to freak anybody out. Um, I don't want you to go running and saying, Dr. Hobson said that our national food um, safety system is, is um, under fire and we're all gonna be sick. Um, but I just want people to be aware that these are legitimate concerns. Whenever we have our federal um, organizations that are responsible for um, recalling and um, doing inspections. The number of inspections have drastically fallen. The FDA decided in March that they were gonna temporarily suspend inspections. And as you can see in this chart, inspections and citations have, have drastically reduced over the last couple of months. Um, the USDA, which inspects meat and poultry plants, um, are continuing to do inspections, but they do have fewer inspectors on the job. Um, I'm sure some of you have probably been keeping up with the news and the outbreaks of COVID-19 in meat packing facilities um, or meat processing facilities, and inspectors have gotten ill too, or they're in higher risk groups. So there are fewer inspectors. Um, and recalls have also drastically reduced from the USDA. Um, the USDA does say that they believe that this is because people are have more heightened awareness about safety procedures during this time. Um, so that, that could uh, be a reason why there are reduced recalls. Um, 
And then, but the USDA also um, has granted line speed waivers to poultry plants, to a certain number of poultry plants. So this means they can increase the speed of their production um, without inspection. And so that can cause concern because as you're working faster, we're, as we all work faster, right, we, we can typically make mistakes and there's more opportunity um, potentially for, for infection. So again, I'm not trying to uh, raise alarm bells and these are things that we might not necessarily be able to control right now, but I think it's something that we should watch and we should be aware of in terms of um, large amounts of food that are being processed, um, either without inspection or with waivers, um, and that could uh, result in increased um, uh, food safety concerns. Okay, so other things, that more things that we can control. Um, so can we get COVID-19 from food workers, food packaging, food delivery? Um, um, so there's really no evidence at all that um, COVID-19 is transmitted through food. Right, so even if somebody who was a food worker, a cook, and they had COVID-19, um, it is highly unlikely that they are going to, it's going to contaminate the food and it's going to be passed through food. Most food is going to be cooked at temperatures that would kill the virus, so you really don't need to be concerned about that. Um, there's really no evidence at all either that COVID-19 is spread by touching food packaging, right? So we know that the main form of spread is through droplets and with close contact with people. So that's why we're doing all this social distancing, right? And we're trying to limit our contact with other people or infected people. So um, a lot of people are wondering and people have started to wipe down their groceries with disinfectant wipes or cleaning their groceries once they get home. Um, I would love to take a quick poll of everyone on here too to see if you're doing that. I personally am not. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but I also don't think it's unreasonable, okay? So if this is something that gives you a little bit of peace of mind and you can do it safely, then why not? Um, but I, I, I don't think it's necessary, but what I do think is necessary is washing our hands often to avoid contact with people as much as we can and to wash our hands as often as possible. So get your groceries home, put them away, wash your hands um, before you eat. Wash your hands, right? Okay, and then uh, people are also asking about food delivery. Am I going to, can I get sick from food delivery? Well, the same thing with packaging of your food that has been delivered. If you're concerned about that, you can transfer your food from the container that it came in onto a plate and then wash your hands really well with soap and water for 20 seconds before eating. Um, again, limiting in-person contact if possible with your delivery drivers or your delivery person, um, paying online or over the phone. Um, try to accept the delivery without contact whenever possible. Um, you can ask for them to be delivered to a safe spot outside your home if that's an option. I know that's not an option for some people that might live in high rises or apartment buildings. Um, but otherwise, try to stay at least six feet apart, right? And then again, we can't emphasize enough about washing our hands with soap and water for 20 seconds after um, touching the packaging or having that interaction with a food delivery driver. Okay, and like I said, I know I'm kind of um, getting closer to the end of, how am I doing on time, Janet? Am I? You're doing just great. Okay, great. Um, so whenever we think about food safety at home, and this again is um, not just specific to COVID-19, but again, this is not the time to be ill or to get sick with a, a, another infectious disease. This is not the time that you want to, to go visit your healthcare providers. Um, this is not the time that you wanna be isolated at home and, and stuck with roommates and stuck with family members and have, um, have a foodborne illness. Um, there's no good time actually to have a foodborne illness. That's why we really need to think about um, our food practices at home, especially for those of us who might be new to cooking or cooking a lot more at home now that we are, are isolated. So the foods that we really want to think about are basically all foods that are not highly processed. We call these potentially hazardous foods. These are foods that are commonly or that can be um, uh, contaminated with um, pathogenic mi microorganisms. And we really need to think about the time and temperature control for these foods. So foods of animal origin, um, heat treated or plant origin of plant origin foods, raw seed sprouts, um, cut melons and leafy greens, 
garlic and oil mixtures. We also call these time and temperature control for safety foods or TCS foods. And I want to talk about that, that time and temperature. So this is um, this um, scale here of, of cooking temperatures and reheating temperatures. You can find, commonly find this on the web. You can go to the USDA, the FDA, the CDC, um, foodsafety.gov, and you can get these charts for the, the proper temperatures to cook and heat our food to. But the temperature danger zone, 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the, the, the temperature range that we really want to keep food out of because of the potential for pathogens to grow and thrive during that, during, or in that um, temperature range. So um, I won't get into the specifics of the internal temperatures that we should be cooking meat to, um, but think about that whenever you are cooking food at home, and then think about time in the temperature danger zone. So we really don't want food in that temperature danger zone for more than six hours when we're cooling food, for two hours when we're reheating it, or two hours when it, while it's sitting out and only one hour if it's at an ambient temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And this is really important for summer activities. So if we're thinking about picnicking or, or having barbecues or having people over, um, which we may be doing less of this summer than we typically would, we really don't want these foods to sit out um, at temperatures um, in the temperature danger zone if outside temperatures are above 90 degrees Fahrenheit for very long. Okay, so some of the risk factors that have been identified by the CDC as primary contributors to foodborne disease outbreaks is improper holding temperatures. So again, having foods in that temperature danger zone for too long. Poor personal hygiene. Again, we just cannot emphasize enough about the importance of washing our hands and washing often. Um, improper cooking temperatures, foods from unsafe sources, and contaminated equipment and cross-contamination. So we have a lot of control over one, two, three, and five. We don't necessarily have a lot of control over number four. Um, so that's why we say the things that we can do at home and if you're in food service is clean, separate, cook, and chill, right? So clean, again, washing hands and surfaces often. Um, separating, so don't cross-contaminate. Um, keep, keep raw meats um, and poultry away from fresh fruits and vegetables or, or ready-to-eat foods. Um, don't also use the same equipment, so try not to cross-contaminate your equipment. So you want to use the same knife that you, you know, cut up chicken with to then also chop the, the lettuce that you're going to use in a salad. Or you want to use the same cutting board before washing, washing that properly. Um, cooking to the right temperature. I bet if I also took a quick poll of everyone on here and I asked how um, or do you consistently use a, a thermometer when you're cooking, um, I bet it would probably be a really, really low percentage of us. Um, I will say I'm kind of guilty of that too sometimes. I try to do it as often as I can, but I also am just like many people and, and I like to eyeball it. Um, this is not a good public health practice. We all should be using um, temp uh, uh, meat thermometer thermometers to um, know the temperature that we're cooking our, our um, meats and poultry to. And then chilling it, so refrigerating properly and promptly. Okay, now I know that I am kind of running low on time, but I am going to move now into chemical safety. Um, and so I think we're probably all very aware, whoops, went the wrong way there, of the infamous April 23rd White House press conference when President Trump had musings and wonderings about whether or not injecting a disinfectant could be a potential cure for coronavirus. So we know um, that we should not be drinking bleach. Um, there was a lot of uh, media attention around this, um, pop culture, comedy, uh, memes around um, drinking bleach. Um, that's, if you really listen to his, his comments, that's not really what he was suggesting. Um, but when you're in a position of power like that, your words do mean a lot. Um, so there were people who um, did um, ingest bleach and other disinfectants after um, um, his talk or after that press conference and there are a lot of media reports about um, spikes in, in poison in calls to poison control centers. So poison control centers, we have 55 of them in the United States and they are, um, they provide free medical advice and management um, 24 hours a day for exposure to chemicals, medicines, um, other things that we might be exposed to in our homes. 
and in the workplace. Um, and so there were a lot of media reports about the increases in the 48 hours after um, the press conference about people not necessarily exposed or drinking or injecting disinfectants, um, but people wondering if it was safe. Right, so a lot of increases in calls to, to, for people asking about the safety, safety of it. Um, although I'd like to say that we did not need the president's words um, to, um, to see an increase in the number of calls to poison control centers. So this is data looking at increases in exposures to cleaners and disinfectants from January to um, March 31st of this year. Um, and over on the left, we have increases in cleaners. This spike in January was an a, a exposure in a school setting. Um, and then over here, we, on the right, we have disinfectants. This is a 20% increase um, from, well, actually, not, this wasn't increased. They, there were 45,000 calls between January 1st and, and March 31st, and that was a 20% increase from this time last year. Um, but if we look at the data a little bit more closely, I don't have it on here. Um, most of, there were increases, whoops, there were increases in most age groups, um, but the highest increases were exposures to children under five years old. So again, with food safety, we're really concerned about protecting our young children. With chemical and disinfectant safety, we're also very interested in, in um, protecting young children. Um, I think part of this is because we're all at home now. Kids who might be in school or daycare or preschool are now at home, so that's part of it. But the other issue is that we um, have these, have our disinfectants and cleaners out and we're using them a lot more and that's increasing exposures. And um, one of the um, exposures, so inhalation exposures went up 108% for disinfectants from 2019 to 2020. Again, the numbers are fairly small, but it definitely shows that we're being exposed to these things in homes and we've had an increase in calls because people are concerned about the effects that they're having on themselves or their children. So what are some of those impacts? So um, with most cleaners and disinfectants, they contain um, chemicals, volatile organic compounds, solvents um, that, are, that are irritants to the skin and eyes. So dermal and ocular contact can um, cause uh, irritation. Um, inhalation, so we have a lot of irritation of the airways. I think if anybody's done this at home and has sprayed too much, you know right away that you are, are um, experiencing a little bit of respiratory distress. That's why we're supposed to spray these things in limited quantities and in well-ventilated areas. So it can cause acute respiratory respiratory distress, coughing, trouble breathing, etc. Again, you don't want to be experiencing coughing and trouble breathing right now, right, whenever we have this um, pandemic, this uh, novel virus that is also causing acute respiratory symptoms. Um, and can also uh, um, aggravate chronic respiratory conditions like asthma and, and COPD. Um, and then ingestion, you can, you can probably think about the many different um, system effects that ingestion of chemicals and disinfectants can have. And the reason why we are so interested in children's exposures is because children are not just necessarily tiny adults. They have unique exposure pathways and exploratory behaviors that we don't necessarily have as, as adults. Um, we know that exposures to environmental hazards can have an effect from conception to birth through childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. And these unique exposure pathways like crawling or playing on the floor puts them at closer contact to things that can be on the floor. Um, they also have those exploratory behaviors like mouthing. Um, I always tell my st students about the um, time that I was in a public restroom with my children and my then four-year-old licked the handrail inside a, a bathroom stall, a public bathroom stall. And I was you know, kind of petrified thinking, you know, of course he's gonna get, he's gonna become sick. He did not, thankfully, um, but they have those things, they have those exploratory behaviors that put them a little bit higher risk than, than adults do. Um, one of the reports from the increased calls to um, poison control centers was of a young preschool age girl who drank um, hand sanitizer. 
and her blood alcohol levels were um, over four times higher than the um, legal or the legal alcohol limit for adults. Um, she spent 48 hours in the hospital being closely monitored. So again, exploratory behaviors, most adults would not rationally pick up a bottle of hand sanitizer and drink it, but kids do things that the adults don't necessarily do. And they also have different inhalation rates. So um, they have higher met metabolic rate and oxy oxygen consumption um, rate per unit of body weight than adults. So their inhalation exposures are also um, a little bit different than ours. And, and again, why we have to think about how we are using aerosolized um, disinfectants in our homes. Okay, so some of the safety tips for um, cleaners and disinfectants. So, um, so COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 um, is a relatively easy virus to kill. There are many registered disinfectants that kill um, that kill um, uh, COVID-19. And there's a list of disinfectants for use that have been approved by the EPA if anyone is interested in those. But again, really, really important to follow the um, safety guidelines. So read and follow the directions on the label. It's so important. I always read the back of all cleaners and disinfectants and, and medicines and, and um, over the counter and prescription medicines just because I think it's so fascinating to look at the information that's included. And I want to make sure that I'm using these things correctly. Um, not only for safety, but also for effectiveness. So if you'll notice on the back of your um, disinfectants, they, a lot of them do require some uh, amount of contact time. So maybe four minutes. I think this one on, on um, the left here requires four minutes for the disinfectant to work properly. So always read and follow dir the directions on the label. Um, only dilute with warm water if you're diluting at all. Um, avoid mixing, absolutely avoid mixing any types of cleaners and disinfectants, but especially bleach with any type of cleaner that has ammonia. Um, when that happens, there's a toxic gas that is, that is created and inhaling that can cause major damage. Um, wear eye and skin protection when necessary. Um, ensure adequate ventilation and then lastly, store chemicals out of the reach of children. Um, I think we can't you know, washing our hands to protect ourselves and also to make sure that we are protecting children by storing chemicals out of out of their reach are really things that I can't highlight enough through this talk. Okay, and with that, I'm going to end. And um, I think we're at time for questions. Wonderful. Angela, thank you so much. Great information. Lots of good comments coming in from the chat and people exchanging their hand washing protocols. You would be pleased oh, good. Um, out there. They're taking it seriously. Uh, uh -huh. So I see that um, Laura Ionati has just said wonderful talk, Dr. Hobson. Um, she's curious about increases in, and I'm going to perhaps say this wrong, um, Yersinia and Vibrio infection test related as you suggested. Yeah, so um, Laura, I, I, I'm not sure if you're talking about just in general or um, the Yersinia, the, the um, disparity in Yersinia for African Americans versus um, others. But um, so Vibri, oh, so I'll get to both of those things. Um, so, you know, I think we also are understanding with Vibrio and other um, foodborne illnesses that this is also related to climate change, right? And those pathogens being more likely to contaminate um, shellfish and other um, aquatic organisms that we're eating. So I think the increases in Vibrio are, are um, directly linked to what we're seeing happening in climate change. Um, with Yersinia, it might be the same, um, but specifically um, the exposures and the disparity in, in rates for African Americans is that it's associated more with a more culturally specific food. So um, chitterlings or chitlins, so those are the intestines of, of pigs. Um, and so whenever, and the, and the Yersinia is in the intestines, and so when those are not boiled properly or cooked properly, that bacteria stays. Um, but I don't know if Yersinia is necessarily on the increase due to climate change like some of the others like Vibrio is. Great. Uh, so a question from Jason. Uh, he's wondering, 
Um, in this time of the pandemic, and you had mentioned some of the key regulative bodies, regulatory bodies that um, protect our food supply and keep us safe. He's just wondering what has stood out to you during the pandemic regarding their actions or lack of action. Yeah, I mean, I think that this, that's an interesting question. And I think um, that, you know, they are, um, these regulatory bodies are trying to act in the best interest of both the producers and the consumers. And I think that can be kind of a hard challenge to meet. Um, and while we want to um, keep our food supply, um, we have a lot of demand right now and we go to the grocery stores and we see that, you know, things are, you know, shelves are bare and um, the grocery stores might have a, a harder time to restock. We kept being, we keep being told that our food supply is, is adequate and that grocery stores are going to restock. Um, but I think that, you know, they've had to relax some standards just so that producers can supply on the, the level that we are demanding it right now. Um, so, you know, I think that's tricky. I also think that regardless of the actions that they take, so if there are um, fewer inspections or if there are relaxed standards, um, you know, the, the responsibility really is on the company, right? Like they are the ones that should be ensuring safe practices in their facilities. And this extra safety net that inspections um, provide is really great but it shouldn't be the thing, right, that keeps us safe. It really should be a culture of safety um, in the production facilities. And I think, you know, I think most people want to do the right thing. Um, and most people, you know, nobody wants to have that responsibility of making children sick or even adults sick. Um, so they want to do the right thing. It's just that, you know, we have to be very, um, they have to be very careful and, and intentional about how they're doing that, especially right now if, when production um, has, is increasing to meet our demands. Wonderful, thank you. Amanda would like for you to speak just a little bit more about egg safety in particular, um, having heard conflicting information previously about what's safe and what's worrying. Um, gosh, so I don't know if we have, if we have, uh, can we clarify just egg safety in general or something particular right now? I think it was just in general, uh, perhaps um, it was salmonella risk, uh, whether eggs are okay to eat raw, what needs to be um, ha handling them in the kitchen. Right, yeah. So, um, so eggs are uh, associated with um, salmonella. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the safe thing to do is never to eat raw eggs, um, especially when you're, you know, baking. And I know it's really tempting to eat the batter. I'm guilty of that sometimes too. And my kids are always clamoring to be able to, you know, lick the batter or, you know, put their fingers in it, which is Know, not safe in and of itself. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there is definitely cause to be concerned with eating raw eggs um, because of the association with salmonella, for sure. Great. Yeah, she clarified that her, her interest was, you, you had mentioned, kind of a reduction in inspections and safety monitoring overall. Um, but I, I think that you'd said that was just something for us to be aware of. I, it's something to be aware of. Um, you know, if you were to read or to, um, the FDA's um, release uh, on, on, on why they decided to relax that standard, or if you were to um, if you were to interview somebody from the FDA, they would try to ensure us that they think egg safety can be maintained even while they've relaxed some of those standards. Um, so, you know, I think for the most part, we have to trust that. Um, I know that can be hard when we say trust trust our government officials. I know we you know that raises some concerns, um, but I think also that um, if what we are doing in our own homes um, has to also play into that, right? We can't just rely on the government. We can't just rely on our producers and our and the processors. We have to also, because like I said, there are a lot of places where things can go wrong. There's a lot of um, responsibility all along that food production or that food um, production chain or that food supply chain and consumer um, consumer uh, behaviors are also you know part of part of that chain. So I think that 
you know, we can't necessarily rely on those other things. We can't necessarily control that, but what we can do is be safe whenever we're preparing and eating foods in our home. Great, thank you. So we have many great questions to get to, um, possibly more questions than we have time, but we're gonna do the best we can. Sorry, I went over with my talk. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, they're popping up late, but all kinds of really good, um, good and well-informed inquiries people have. So Cheryl would like it if you could talk just a little bit more about drive-through safety in this mm. time of the pandemic. She's just kind of wondering what you would do, talk us through, would you wear a mask? Would you wait and warm things up when you got home? What, what do you think? Yeah, so I, that's a really great question. And um, I think, you know, right now our guidelines are yes to wear a mask, um, especially if you're in a drive through and you're not necessarily six feet away from the person that's handing you your food. Um, I personally have not gone through a drive through lately, but I'm imagining that that six foot separation is a little bit difficult when you're trying to hand somebody their order. Um, so I think wearing a mask makes makes sense in that in that um, situation. Um, I think that the packaging, again, the packaging concern. So if you're concerned that somebody that handled the packaging within the in the restaurant may have contaminated hands and contaminated the packaging, again, I think the important thing to do is to wash hands or to sanitize your hands before you put the food in your mouth. Um, so taking it out of the, the packaging, if you can, if you're eating in the car, which I'm not suggesting. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, doing that then also to, and you don't have hand washing facilities available to you to have hand sanitizer and to be sure to sanitize your hands before you eat. And then, yeah, if you, if you're taking it home and you, and you feel like you want to warm it up just for general food safety concerns anyway, again, um, that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do to not only, you know, if you're concerned about COVID, but definitely if you're concerned about other pathogens, heating it up to a proper temperature is, is never a bad idea. Great. Thank you. So Angela is wondering um, if there is a website that you particularly like to look up the chemical components that are listed in dis disinfectants. If somebody's trying to make heads or tails of what a label says, where should they go to learn more? Yeah, so on um, that slide that I know Janet is going to post these slides, um, this slide, the EPA um, uh, list in disinfectants, I think you can quite find quite a bit of information there about the different chemicals that are in, um, in the um, different disinfectants and cleaners. Um, the EPA also just has a, a general, so you could search, you know, I, I, and I'm blanking off the top of my head, but um, they also have um, a chemical database and usually list um, the, the, the different chemicals that are in these types of cleaners. So I would so first start off with um, just a search of the EPA looking for a cleaners list and you should be able to find it. Great. Um, Kitra is wondering uh, if, if someone falls ill and they suspect that they have a foodborne illness, um, do you have any tips or suggestions how to advocate with a doctor that you think you have a foodborne illness rather than you know just an acute gastroenteritis 24 hour, why are you bothering me with it? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and probably something that I have not thought very thoroughly about is how to navigate that relationship. If you definitely, you know, if you're interested in having a specimen um, taken so you can really understand if it's a foodborne illness. Um, so I think, you know, having, just having that conversation would be uh, good. Um, I also think that reporting it, and I didn't mention this, that reporting it to your local health department is also especially if you think it's come from a retail food establishment to report it because that's how they understand sometimes even before we have surveillance data when when people report that they've been sick and they think it's from a restaurant that's how we identify outbreaks as well so um, I would also report it to the health department and maybe have that conversation with your physician that you've been in touch with the health department and you have reason to believe that this could be a potential foodborne illness and that you really would like to have um, a, a you know, diagnostic test to do a specimen collection and do a diagnostic test to understand if this is a foodborne illness. Great, thank you. So uh, Dan has a question that is going to require us to go back in the slide deck a little bit. 
Um, regarding uh, the potentially hazardous foods that you mentioned, and he was just curious for any more information that you wanted to share about what is um, at risk with each. Mm. So I recognize that could be a very open-ended question, but um, yeah. See if we can get back here. Okay, so um, really the issue with these foods is when we think about potentially hazardous foods, we're thinking about things that ha are, have moisture, that have low acidity, and that um, we have to think about the time and the time and the temperature that they are cooked to or they're held at. So um, most things that are animal origin, so meats, poultry, dairy, eggs, etc., are just you know higher risk because of the nature of, of where they come from and the type of processing that they go to and are just typically um, more exposed to um, pathogens that that might live in intestinal tracts, um, things that are in fecal material, and the processing of those things expose um, those the the meat to those those pathogens. Um, things of plant origin. So again, um, this a lot of times, uh, raw, you know, even raw seed sprouts, cut melons and leafy greens, and we saw a lot of um, outbreaks recently with romaine lettuce and E. coli, and these are things that we don't typically think of as being potentially hazardous foods, but uh, what happens a lot of times is um, they're contaminated somewhere in the harvest or the, the processing immediately thereafter, maybe the water that they're rinsed with has been contaminated, there have been you know, um, workers who have, have not had proper hygiene and have contaminated the, you know, the, the, the food. Um, maybe the irrigation water that they're using has been contaminated. So there's a lot of areas for missteps along the way. And, um, you know, cut melons on here, you know, that's on there too. And we, there've been a lot of um, multi-state outbreaks with salmonella related to cut melons. And the thing that the, is the issue is that you know, the, the contaminants might be on the outside and you might not eat that, right? Especially with cantaloupe or watermelon, but you cut through it, right? So you have a knife and you cut through the melon and then whatever contaminants are on the outside are then cross-contaminated into the inside, the part that we eat, right? So a lot of these foods, um, you know, even if you're, if you're not thinking about them as a traditionally hazardous food, there's somewhere along the production line or the processing line where something is contaminated and then there's a high likelihood that these foods are then also contaminated and, and can, um, you know, have the right environment for different pathogens to thrive. Great, thank you. So we have time for just one more question and, um, Lindsay Brainerd, who says hi to you personally, so I think that must be somebody that you know. Yes. Um, she has uh, been hearing about people disinfecting groceries, mm -hmm. uh, like buying fruit, wiping it down with a Clorox or Lysol wipe, and then rinsing it later prior to um, eating. Uh, wow. Any thoughts about the, the, the wisdom of that practice? <laughs> I really just don't think that's necessary at all <laughs> and could probably cause other harm, right? If, the, if, if, you know, if people are then ingesting whatever um, residue might be left from um, the, the disinfectant. I really think that if you want to be safe, you can simply, and I do this even in times of, of non-COVID-19, is to wash fruits and vegetables before I eat them. Um, the foodsafety.gov website recommends just rinsing with water. And the reason why they don't recommend soap is because they are concerned that people will ingest um, soap or cleaners that they're not intended to ingest. Um, and, but I think that, you know, washing with a mild detergent um, or some mild soap and making sure that you rinse that really good is, is plenty effective at washing off not only pathogens, but also dirt that you may not necessarily want to ingest. Um, I really just don't think it's necessary to uh, disinfect our fruits and vegetables with, um, with disinfectant wipes, especially if you're concerned, you know, with supply, you know, disinfectant, most stores are sold out of disinfectant wipes. Um, you know, they, uh, 
I think I saw some estimates that it'll be sometime this summer before stores are resupplied just due to the nature of making all of those and getting them distributed. Um, so I think it's probably a waste of resources to use your disinfectant wipes and it's also just not necessary. I think washing with a little mild soap and making sure to rinse really well um, is, is plenty effective. Great, thank you for that. Are there any closing comments that you, you want to offer the group? No, I just want to say thank you. I didn't take a look necessarily at who joined, but I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. I hope it was somewhat informative for you. And um, again, I have my contact information on the very last slide. I welcome any comments, feedback, questions, concerns. Um, please feel free to email me at any time. And so thank you so much for giving us your time today. Thank you so much. This was very informative and obviously lots of folks had questions about how to be as safe as possible um, in these times, but much of this information is for all time. Um, so I'll close out everybody with uh, just a few programming notes. Uh, we'll be back on Open Classroom Tuesday for uh, Professor Brett Drake, who's going to be presenting on finding and using big data from home. Many of us are at home and research techniques and ability to access information. He's gonna be sharing resources with you. Um, I also wanna share something else that's going on within the professional development department. Uh, the Brown School Summer Institute is going fully online this year and our registration deadline is coming up in a few weeks. So if you're enjoying these brief lectures and they've got you hungry to return to a classroom for more of a small group interactive and, and skill building opportunity, we have 13 different classes in the areas of data, management, leadership, and policy. And um, we would love to have you join us. I'm gonna throw the link to the website right there. But if you're interested, you could reply to anything Open Classroom has sent you and we would be happy to talk you through what we have going on. Um, with that, thank you all so much for, for joining us, for participating in this community. Uh, please stay healthy and safe and we hope to see you again very soon. Thanks all, bye. Thank you so much, Janet and Brayden, thank you. Thank you.